that help us to regenerate our bodies or that we simply don't have enough stem cells, such as the planaria, who's full of them. So let's look at the one about cancer. Now, why do I bring this up? Any cell that can launch a proliferative response the way the explosive divisions that you see early on in embryogenesis take place has the capacity to go wrong because cancer is cell division gone horribly wrong. And so when we think about that extraordinary growth of the little salamander's limb, we have to realize that that is putting the salamander, in theory, in risk of getting cancer. And why is that? Differentiation, as you heard from Doug, in, involves taking a cell that is uncommitted and very potent to become many different things and to, m assigning functions to its daughter cells. But during that regenerative, the regenerative event that we saw in the newt, another event occurs, which I'd like to just mention here. And that is that same one that we heard about from Doug in the pancreas, a differentiating cell actually dividing. But in this case, the division is such that a backward step is taken so that now the cell is, in fact, potent again and can become more than one thing. And that's why we could see those muscle stem cells becoming cartilage or epidermis in the limb because dedifferentiation can occur. Now, in a tumor, that's exactly what happens. A normal cell divides and grows in a way that is consistent with its environment until a mutation somehow takes out some essential break on proliferation. And then the cell proliferates in a way that is inconsistent with its position, and it essentially grows out of control, and that's a tumor. So in theory, a cell that's dedifferentiated is a cell that could be a cancer cell. So what's the difference? Why don't newts get cancer? Let's just look at dedifferentiation, and specifically in the case of muscle, because I mentioned the fact that muscle can dedifferentiate in the case of the newt's amputated limb. Here's a close-up of what muscle cells look like after you've cut the limb off at the stump. Very soon afterwards, these muscle cells, which are rather specialized in the sense that they have multinuclei inside a single cytoplasm that's full of contractile proteins for their capacity to contract, these different nuclei sever themselves off, compartmentalize themselves, take a few organelles, put a, a, a membrane around them, and run off to become new stem cells. This is a, a rather dramatic thing. And we don't know what the signal is to do that, but that would be a very interesting answer to one of our students' questions. And that's perhaps why it is that the blastema can then form so rapidly because there's lots of muscle at that cut wound, and all of it can start to produce these potent little progenitor cells. These cells can come from bone. They can come from muscle. And in general, they regrow the limb structure very, very rapidly. So there must be something about the limb which is different from the rest of the proliferative processes that we find in our bodies that go awry. And so to understand the difference between dedifferentiation in these kinds of animals and the uncontrolled dedifferentiation that we have is one of the great goals of regenerative biology. So the answer is, the risk doesn't seem to be there in these animals. Would it be in us? Now, another possibility is that we have the loss or alteration of a genetic program. Well, that's sort of obvious. Something's lost. Otherwise, we could do it. And in fact, we know that there's an inverse relationship between evolutionary uh, scale, here shown with the bodybuilder as the epitome of evolution, and uh, <laughs> the lowly planaria, uh, who probably doesn't like being at the bottom, um, but can do a much better job of re reproducing itself. So somewhere along the line, we have lost some programs. We can grow muscle, that's for sure. We can look like that woman, or at least some of you probably can. But what we can't do is amputate her arm and grow it back. So some kind of a program is missing. And so scientists have asked, what are the potential 
signals that could be present in the newt limb that are absent in our more developed and larger bodies. And a clue from this came from a beautiful experiment that Jeremy Brox did several years ago in which he asked the question, if I cut the newt limb off below the elbow near the wrist, what grows? And the answer is a little blastema forms as you see and over the 70 days that it takes to regrow that limb, it grows exactly what it needs to, basically just the lower part of the forearm, the wrist and the hand. Then Jeremy cut off the limb at above the elbow position and asked what happens. And in the same period of time, the blastema knew to grow an elbow, a forearm, a wrist, and a limb, and a hand rather. So something in that stump knew where it was. And at the time that it was amputated, immediately launched a new program that would be different if the amputation happened here or if it happened here. So one possible way of thinking about this is that there's something that's different in its concentration at the top of your arm and at the bottom of your arm, and that that gives you some kind of a zip code to know where you are along your arm, even in an adult like the newt. And in fact, recently, the same group has come upon a cell surface molecule, which has this really sexy name, CD59. And CD59 turns out to be at very high levels on the surface of cells of the limb proximal to the body and at much lower levels on cells in the limb down at the wrist. And so the question they asked is, could CD59 give cells an address? Or is it just a correlation? And to answer that question, they did some very ele elegant experiments. They tried to change a cell's address by giving a cell more CD59 than it should see. So in this case, what they did on the top is a control in which they took a cell out of the limb before it was amputated and labeled it with a red dye and then replaced it into the growing blastema of an amputated limb and asked where do the progeny of that cell end up. So all the cells have the mark and the progeny have the mark. And as you see, the cell ends up at the right place in the wrist because that's where it came from. Now we do the same experiment, except this time we engineer that cell to express a lot of this cell surface protein CD59. And then we put the cell back into the same position on the blastema. And as you can see in the lower panel, that cell thinks that it should be down here somewhere because of the higher levels of CD59 that it's expressed. So it's probably cordoned off and the guy says, hey, you, you should be down at that end. The problem is, that it's not a benign arrangement because, in fact, the whole experiment results in a deformation of the limb. So that not only does this tell the cell where to go, and it's a different place, but once it's there, it produces some sort of deformity. And in fact, what we see is that on the control on the left, there are a number of different concentrations of CD59 shown on the bottom in a schematic way with different colors, and those color uh, orders are dis in disarray and are um, disrupted by the presence of cells expressing too much CD59. So there's no more green cells because the cells that are there are expressing CD59 at a level that should be red. So in theory, what you could say then is that we obviously have lost the CD59 zip code and therefore we simply don't have the right programs to do the job and we'll never be able to regenerate because we wouldn't be able to know how to grow that new limb. So a question then is, are, are humans and mammals just incapable of regeneration because we can't afford it because of cancer or because we don't have the right programs? Well, the answer is no. And improbable as it may seem, this is the only case of true regeneration in the mammalian kingdom. Now, for those of you who've never seen one of these before, it's a deer with antlers. And for those of you who know nothing about deer with antlers, this is very seasonal, 